notice where in your body you feel the experience. And sometimes it can even feel like it's outside your body. So just take a moment to locate the part of your body that you feel that like sensation. And it can show up as thoughts, which are just stories in your head, or feeling sensations or images. Be aware that whatever comes up is a communication from that part. Like maybe your chest feels heavy under pressure, your stomach tightens up. Notice it and just be aware of it. Send loving breaths to that area. Hi, and welcome to the Stethoscopes to Swaddles podcast, episode number 73. Welcome to this episode. We are going to be talking about self-kindness when we are flooded. Now, last week on the episode on the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, I briefly talked about what flooding is, and I wanted to do an episode specifically about flooding and how to take care of ourselves when we are emotionally flooded, during conflict, during states of high emotional sensations. And so this episode is going to be focusing on how to be really, really kind and nurturing to ourselves in those moments. So we're first going to start out by defining what flooding is. And then we are going to talk about a little bit about protest and why protest is important for us. We're going to talk about how to be kind and develop wholesome self-talk when we are flooded. I thought this was important, and I think this series for the next few weeks is kind of going to focus on just like taking care of ourselves and noticing our emotions, noticing when we are not taking care of ourselves, and being kind to ourselves. Um, I, you know, like I talk about on this episode, I love to read, and every time a book gets suggested to me, I'm always like, Okay, let me finish the one that I'm reading, and then um, I will work on the other one. And then sometimes I end up reading two books at once. And so here lately, I have been putting into practice the work of Deb Dana and Deidre Fay. Uh, Deidre Fay wrote a book called Becoming Safely Embodied. And Deb Dana is the author of Anchored, How to Befriend Your Nervous System and Using Polyvagal Theory. I will link these two books in the show notes if you want to listen to them or read them. The other one that I actually have been listening to in the car and during my downtime is a talk that uh, Kristin Neff, who is the guru of self-compassion, she did a workshop and then she published it as an audible book. And so that has like a lot of meditations in it, a lot of, you know, kind practices to ourselves. So I will link the three in the show notes should you want to look at them and look into them. I think they will help you if you just don't know where to start with understanding your emotions and processing your emotions and being kind to yourself. So let's get started. Hey mama, you deserve a life free of overwhelm and burnout. Welcome to the Stethoscopes to Swaddles podcast. I'm your host, life and mindset coach, Shiro Bergbauer. I'm also a wife, mom, and CRNA. This is the podcast for high achieving mamas in medicine like you and I. Together, we'll learn how to navigate the ups and downs of working motherhood. If you're looking to thrive in your relationships, and overcome overwhelm in your motherhood, marriage, and medicine, you're in the right place. Welcome to the Stethoscopes to Swaddles podcast. So flooding is the actual, like, science definition of flooding is diffuse physiological arousal. And before I tell you the science definition, I want to tell you a quick story to kind of just bring into play what it looks like maybe in the brain when we flood. So in 2017, I believe it was August, in Houston, Texas, we experienced Hurricane Harvey. Now, prior to that, my husband and I, my siblings and some friends, we were going on a cruise. And I don't even remember where this cruise was going to, to be completely honest with you. But we were going on a Royal Caribbean cruise and it was supposed to leave on Sunday morning. 
And for some odd reason, Royal Caribbean, shame on them, would not cancel the cruise. They just kept telling us the cruise is on, the cruise is on, we're not taking any cancellations. And so we were like kind of just torn because there were no flights coming into Houston. And so my siblings couldn't fly in. And we were just like, well, we'll take our losses if the if the if the you know ship leaves, then we'll just the two of us will go. So Saturday night, I actually remember Friday purchasing all these hurricane supplies and my husband deciding that there was no hurricane coming. And in his infinite wisdom, he started to eat the snacks. And just a quick side note, I've told my husband, if there's a zombie apocalypse, I will probably have to eat him because he will eat the snacks and then we'll starve. But so he just was like, oh, it's not coming. And we packed our bags for the cruise. And I was just like, you know, like when you're like halfway in, halfway out, like you don't even know what to trust. It was that kind of scenario. Anyway, so we go to sleep and it pours and it pours. And I woke up in the morning and I hadn't even looked outside. And I had a text from my neighbor. So we had this little creek that ran behind our backyard. And my neighbor texted me and she goes, it looks like your cruise ship will be leaving from the backyard. And (laughs) I just burst out laughing. I opened the window and oh my gosh, the entire yard was submerged in water. Like the creek had like the burst into our yard. There was water everywhere, like trees, like it was just horrific. It was water everywhere. This was like the image of the flood. When my husband went outside to the front door, the water was like up to the steps. And like he got into the water because he's a daredevil like that. And it was like the water was like up to his knees. It was so much water. It was crazy. But then here was the other funny part. All the trash cans in the neighborhood had decided to go on a sailing trip. And so when the water like pushed them, they all went into the creek and some got stuck like at the side of the creek, but it was literally like, like trash can, like just got flooded. The reason I share this analogy is because when I think of flooding, I literally think of like all systems just go ar- awry, like the trash cans go in the creek. To me, like our yard actually eroded. It was like, you know, so much drama getting it repaired. That is what I think of when I think of emotionally flooding. So diffuse physiological arousal, which is also known as flooding, is our body's general alarm mechanism, which we inherited through evolutionary means. And the reason we flood is so that we can mobilize ourselves so we can effectively cope with crisis or emergencies. So it's our brain's way of like sounding the danger alarm and telling us like, go, get out of the situation. And it can be characterized by different symptoms. Uh, You can have like, you know, sweaty palms and, you know, heart rate goes up. There's a release of uh, chemicals from your body. Again, it is it's a very primitive emotional response that we developed again when we lived in caves. And it's very important to just be aware that it is part of who we are. It's because our body is sensing threat, right? And so we have a flood of stress hormones, which is the flood, that include adrenaline and cortisol to the nervous system. And that is how the fight or flight response gets generated. So I want you to think about, like, imagine this water that was just running in my backyard and my front yard as cortisol and adrenaline and it's just like pushing all the trash cans like it's literally pushing any logic out of your brain so usually when we are flooded and overwhelmed we are no longer experiencing the facts at the moment rather the experience becomes just like a tangled network of sensations feelings and thoughts and then the present moment typically merges into a previously undigested experience so Again, I want you to think about you're flooded and now these sensations, feelings and thoughts are like all the trash cans in the neighborhood and, you know, the weeds that you forgot to take out last week. They're now tangled in the present moment. That is what flooding in the brain looks like. If you ever find yourself in the moment where you're having an emotional response that is not congruent with what's happening in the moment, 
and you feel that it's like just so much, it's too big and it's too charged and you feel lost in it, you could probably assume that it's fueled by painful past association. And the thing to do is first separate the past from the present. So you want to look around you and like, what are you seeing right now? Like, how old are you in this moment? And again, if it's like supercharged, it probably involves a trigger and association of the past. Like you feel a strong pull to the past. I'm going to offer you some statements you can say to yourself that can preempt the tendency to regress. And these are suggestions from Didier Fay. And the w- if you just like use this sentence with the determination not to re-traumatize yourself, you can actually avoid so many needless moments because you don't bring the past into the present. There are five key statements and I'm going to read them out loud and just like maybe embody saying them in the moment when you find yourself trapped in the past. The first one is, The danger is not happening now. Second is something old is being triggered. It's just you create that awareness for yourself that you know something old is being triggered. Third is this is about the past. Number four, if it's this bad now, it gives me a sense of how hard it was then. Number five. I will not allow my history to keep me from living the life that I want now. And I thought this was important to share in this episode because very often when I'm coaching my clients, we'll have a conversation about maybe a conflict or a discussion that happened with their partners or at work. And then when we dig deeper, they realize that the the thing that is actually triggering their reaction in that moment is not what their spouse said or what their spouse did. So like I recently had a conversation with somebody who was in a new relationship and they felt like they were bringing maybe their traumas from the past relationship into the new relationship. And that, if it goes unchecked, can now start to like be projecting, right? If you maybe had an issue of you know, mistrust of your partner in your previous relationship and you're in a new relationship and you're being triggered in that sense and let's say your partner forgets to text you and now you have this reaction like that is almost like the reaction of finding out your spouse had been unfaithful in a past relationship. They're not related, right? But if it goes unchecked, you will be projecting the emotional response of that past unfaithfulness into the text message that didn't come on time. Hope that makes sense. So I really wanted to touch on that to give all of us an idea of what to do in situations where we find ourselves just like, quote unquote, overreacting, but it really isn't overreacting. So one of the things that was interesting to learn was that research on the brain shows that there are more neural networks that go from our medulla to our brain, from our limbic brain to our frontal cortex, than there are neural networks going from our frontal lobe back to our bodies our limbic system. So when we get activated, we literally have a rush of materials that flood our frontal lobe and it's hard for us to calm down. Like when you get overwhelmed, you know that it takes longer for your body to slow down, right? Because literally our body doesn't have as many networks going from the brain to our body, right? So even though the brain is processing the things and you know, our limbic brain and our frontal cortex are talking, our bodies may be kind of catching up slowly. So in those moments, just like have that awareness for yourself and be kind to yourself to remember nothing's gone wrong. That's your body bodying. Your human is humaning. I recently started using this phrase that I learned from Kara Lowenthal, and it was like, how human of me, right? Like how human of me that I feel overwhelmed and my body is not relaxing. Or how human of me that I am on my cycle and I feel like crying and I just don't know what to do and I feel like something's wrong, right? How human of me that I'm worried about regressing into showing up the way I did in the past. How human of me to be worried and afraid. It's just part of our experience as human beings. One of the things that is important to learn is the concept of protest. If you think about babies, When babies cry, 
it's a sign of protest for them. They're like, something's not right, pick me up. If we don't pick the baby up, the baby goes into despair, right? There's like almost like they give up. Eventually, the baby will stop crying. And if you don't pick that baby up, the baby goes into detachment where they no longer care that nobody is picking them up. So, and we've seen this like in the studies of like children who are raised in like orphanages under poor conditions, that these children have a very difficult time integrating and emoting and connecting with people because they basically got to the state of detachment based on the fact that they did not receive the love and affection that was needed in that time for them to like develop physiologically, right? So in in dater phase work of becoming safely embodied, they take these three phases and they just call them protests, all of them. And that is a way of describing the normal and natural protections that come when we step out of our comfort zone, right? If we haven't had a safe way to connect with ourselves, then our fears, resistances, and blocks arise. So Whenever we're protesting, it's like we're saying it shouldn't be this way. One of the things I think about protest is like arguing with reality, right? So it's like we wish for it to be different. So let's say you are in a situation where, you know, you're having a disagreement with somebody or and you're like, I just want it to be different. But the reality is it's not different because what you are in the now is what is the reality, right? So if you don't get out of that fighting, right, you're pushing it away instead of just being like, okay, this is what I have right now on my plate. How can I handle it differently, right? So most of us have something that we want to be different. We want our relationships to be different. We want our, you know, our work life to be different. We're always looking for a way to meet the need that like the protest is telling us we need. It's a need for connection sometimes. It's a need for self-love. It's a need for loving others, being loved. Whatever is the hope, right? We first have to like be aware of the need that we're trying to find and then meet the need so we can shift the protest. And one of the most important things to note is that protest is based on looking for the fundamental needs that we have, the seven, like the seven functions of secure attachment that John Bowlby studied. And I'm going to just read them to you so that you can kind of see where a lot of these like little areas fall. And it makes sense when you realize like that's, you know, we're like, oh, that's what kids need. That's what humans need. Right. But sometimes we don't realize that those needs are not being met for us. And then we protest. So the seven fundamental needs are, one, to learn basic trust and reciprocity that serve as a template for all future emotional relationships. Number two is to explore the environment with feelings of safety and security, that is, having a secure base, which leads to healthy cognitive and social development. Number three is to develop the ability to self-regulate, which results in effective management of impulses and emotions. Number four is to create the foundation for the formation of an identity that includes a sense of competency, self-worth, and balance between dependence and autonomy. Number five is to establish a pro-social moral framework that involves empathy, compassion, and conscience. Number six is to generate a core belief system that comprises cognitive appraisals of self, caregivers, others, and life in general. Number seven is to provide a defense against stress and trauma, which incorporates resourcefulness and resilience. So if you think about like our little babies, when we're bringing them into the world, we build on these needs for them, right? Like the first need of like building basic trust and reciprocity, right? Like when they know if they cry, we'll pick them up. If they're hungry, we'll feed them because they can't communicate that in the beginning, right? And then like we have the toddler phase, which is now they're learning to self-regulate so that they can effectively manage their impulses and emotions. So in that state, like they're still like practicing the self-regulation and that can be very like uncomfortable for us as parents, right? It's like, okay, you don't have it figured out yet, but you think you do, right? And then like when we think about helping them have a defense against stress and trauma, right? 
It's for them so that they can be resourceful and resilient. And I think sometimes as parents, we think like our job is to protect our children to never experience stress and trauma instead of realizing that our job is to help them learn how to create that defense and be resourceful and resilient. So when we are protesting, we're making it clear that one of these needs isn't being met as adults, right? So we're trying, like, say, if we are not self-regulating, then we protest, for example. So it's just important for us to know that in order for us to create safety for ourselves, we have to be aware of our needs and, like, just kind of pinpoint which need we need to meet for ourselves. So how do we then care for the nervous system so that when we're flooded, we know exactly what to do? The first thing is tuning in into our nervous system, being in the here and now, noticing what is actually happening right now and being in awareness. Second is taking in. So scanning the environment for cues of safety and danger. And then the third one is tending to, taking care of ourselves and being kind to ourselves, creating and cultivating self-kindness and self-compassion. I wanted to read this quote by Carl Jung, and I want you to just take a moment to think about this quote. And if you're not driving, if you're driving, don't do it. I want you to just take a moment to maybe note a couple of thoughts in response to this question. So Carl Jung said, that I feed the beggar, that I forgive an insult, that I love my enemy. All these are undoubtedly great virtues. But what if I should discover that the least among them all, the poorest of the beggars, the most impudent of all offenders, yeah, the very fiend himself, that these are within me, and that I myself stand in the need of the alms of my own kindness, that I myself am the enemy who must be loved. What then? Right? Like, when we realize that sometimes the person we withhold the most kindness from and the most empathy from is ourselves, right? That we can be forgiving to others, but sometimes we don't forgive ourselves. That we don't extend the love to ourselves when we're in moments of self-doubt. Isn't it just so interesting when we realize that we don't turn in words to take care of us, right? So, I wanted to just kind of share that because I want to talk about how you speak to yourself when you're flooded and just like notice for yourself, like how often are you using kind, generous and open hearted language towards yourself? And how often are you doing that towards other people and compare that to the times that you speak negatively to yourself? Because sometimes like the inner mean girl is not the issue. Sometimes it's like the inner kind girl is extending compassion to everybody else but to ourselves, right? So notice when you do that, like when you speak negatively to yourself or you start to diminish yourself, be in awareness of how you treat yourself because awareness is the first step into changing. So how are you treating yourself and in what manner? Because we have to practice treating ourselves gently and with compassion. So I'm going to give you some suggestions for developing wholesome talk. And they are actually four suggestions. The first one is disidentifying. Second one is externalizing. The third one is setting loving or kind boundaries. And then number four is creating an antidote. So first, when we disidentify, We find a way to take what's going on inside of us and separate from it without dissociating. So in this way, like we can just like observe ourselves and witness what is happening to another part. And at times we can disidentify psychologically by thinking about differences and you can do it by writing, drawing or moving your body. Whatever choice you make, just try noticing whether internally you have an internal grounded observer who is paying attention to what's happening. So the first thing in disidentifying is noting. So if you're feeling flooded, it may be helpful for you to name what emotion is overwhelming you and label it. And I talk about this in like permission, uh, the feelings episode 
in Permission to Feel, like one of the first things to do is label and name the emotion. And is it anger? Is it jealousy? Is it anxiety? Is it sadness? Name it. The next thing, which sounds really weird, is practicing saying what emotion it is. So it can just be saying anger, 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 or sadness, sadness. You give your space, yourself space to breathe, and that helps you slow down that overwhelm emotion. Because when we're flooded, we have to remember to breathe, right, before we can proceed. Again, it's like when we're flooded, if I need to go find the trash cans, right, <laughs> I first have to like take a deep breath and then like get out and go find the trash cans, right? Realize that there's more to you than the triggered part. Naming or labeling those parts can sometimes encourage disidentification. So just notice like that you're feeling triggered, noticing the sensation that helps you slow down, and then name and label your emotions. So you reduce the impact of the overwhelm. Externalizing is the next step because sometimes noting is not enough to like get you out of that flooded state. The internal voices sometimes may control a sizable physiological, psychological real estate, right? So in order to counteract those parts, notice where in your body you feel the experience. And sometimes it can even feel like it's outside your body. So just take a moment to locate the part of your body that you feel that like sensation. And it can show up as thoughts which are just stories in your head, or feelings, sensations, or images. Be aware that whatever comes up is a communication from that part. Like maybe your chest feels heavy under pressure, your stomach tightens up. Notice it and just be aware of it. Send loving breaths to that area. Sometimes that feeling may increase as you're noticing it and it may cause you pain, right? Because that's the part that's trying to say something to you to remind you of the experience it was feeling at some other time. Once you have a noticeable, clear idea of the triggered part, speak to it as if it's apart from you. So like just disidentifying simply from it, recognizing that inside of you is a part that is having the experience and another part of you is just witnessing and observing the triggered part of that from the outside. So what I always think is like, I am not my thoughts. Like my thoughts are there and I'm observing them. One helpful way, especially for you moms, is to treat this part as you would a child who is just like overwhelmed, over out, and needs a timeout, right? Speaking to the triggered part as best as you can with kindness and confidence. So it's like saying, yeah, you're really triggered, aren't you? I want to know what's happening. I see that you're really distressed or sad or angry or frustrated or scared or hurt. And it matters to me that you're upset, but I'm afraid I won't do a good job in listening. I'm afraid I might get scared, but I'm willing to try. And if I can do it well now, I'll try again. And if I can't do it well now, I'll try again. Whatever way you feel comfortable doing this, right? Just to let the troubled parts know that you're open to them and you're ready to listen. Like you just practice an openness. In order to feel comfortable, right? You may have to like deep breaths, ground yourself. Take your time to slow down. If you need to take a walk, do that. Because movement can actually alleviate potential flooding that's brought about by the emotional state. Second tip is learning to befriend these states. Making friends with all the parts that comprise your emotional states, right? When you notice that you're getting triggered by internal noise... That is the perfect time for you to be self-compassionate and practice loving kindness. I remember recently I was talking to somebody and she said, you know, I, sometimes I feel like I don't have time. And I remember this quote and I don't know who said it, so it might have been the Buddha. You only need five minutes a day to meditate. But if you don't have five minutes, you need an hour. If you think that you don't need to do the thing, that's when you do actually need it, Right. If you feel like it's going to take too much time to look in words and take care of yourself, befriend your state, just notice that for yourself. And sometimes it's hard to see the internal voices as being parts of yourself. But with practice, you can just externalize them and start to give compassionate intervention. Sometimes when somebody is, you know, mean or rude or unkind, our first instinct is to 
respond the same way, right? So when our parts speak to us, our inner mean girl speaks to us in a way that's critical or demeaning, sometimes we can be like the first reaction is to sink into it, become that or become compliant. So befriending that state is just like stepping away, noticing it, and then just allowing it to be. Setting loving boundaries, loving and kind boundaries, means that sometimes when it's too much just to process and you might be feeling like just like it's so overwhelming and you're just burned out by your own basically flooding, be gentle to yourself, right? This could be the time for you to just practice self-compassion, drop the content, and then turn your attention elsewhere, right? Focus on something else. Maybe pick up a craft, maybe pick up walking and jogging, whatever it is, just set a kind and loving boundary. Like it's like, for example, if your mother-in-law wants to have a discussion about something and it is not the time, you don't decide to just do it just to get over it, right? Sometimes you could be like, this is not a good time. Can we bring it up tomorrow when I have time, right? So that's the same way. If you're feeling flooded and your brain wants to just stay in that moment, you can just be like... I want to focus on something else right now. I'm going to step away from this right now. Okay? Last but not least, it's creating an antidote. So sometimes when we're really in painful situations, we can use fantasy or magical thinking to tolerate our upset. Instead, offset the painful, distressing experience with what you want to cultivate in your life, right? And it can be, you can just look like I'm feeling so much pain and I really just want to hurt less, may I be at peace. I love the idea of reminding yourself that you want to be at peace, that you want to anchor in loving kindness. I just think it's just like, wow, like I am offering myself that I want to be peaceful, that I want to practice loving kindness towards myself, right? It's like this thing that's available and I get to pick it anytime I want. I get to just say, may I be at peace, May I be kind to myself. May I love myself. Whatever antidote you want to create, right? Like if you tend to get triggered and flooded and you can just be like, I'm feeling so much overwhelm, may I find sufficiency, right? Like it doesn't have to go from this one extreme emotion to the other positive emotion. It can just be in the neutral, right? It can be just reminding yourself I'm flooded in this moment. May I practice self-awareness? May I be at peace? May I be kind to myself? There are four sentences that I learned from the work of Christine Neff. When I feel overwhelmed, distressed, emotionally overwhelmed, there are four sentences, and you can borrow them if you want. If they don't, you know, gel with you, that's okay. (laughs) You don't have to use them. And these are, This is a moment of suffering. Suffering is a part of life. May I be kind to myself in this moment. May I give myself the compassion I need. To me, the awareness that I can be kind to myself, that I can look inwards and treat myself like I treat my daughter, even in moments where I can't fix what's happening, It is so reassuring to me. It's the reminder that I know that I can anchor myself and take care of myself in any moment. I was recently telling a client, you know, I I talk about like the hands, hands on the heart, hands on the chest. And sometimes when you're in a public space, it's kind of hard to do that, right? And I was telling a client, sometimes I just like grasp my own hand. And it's the thing my husband and I do when we're driving too. Like he'll just hold my hand and squeeze it. And so when I do that for myself, it's like I'm reminding myself, I have everything I need and I can be kind to myself, right? When the world is sending me messages that it's selfish or indulgent to take care of myself, I just remind myself, I have my own back. I have my back no matter what. Like you, me, Shiro, we go together, and I always have your back. The same way that my daughter knows that I have her back, right? 
because I always think the one person that we're always willing to extend kindness and compassion to is our kids, right? So that's why I always use the example of my daughter. So if you know that you have your own back, like what would you do differently? What would you do differently if you truly believed that you were deserving of the kindness that you extend to everybody else? Would you forgive yourself more, right? Would you hold the past against yourself less? Would you create a vision for who you want to become and lose the attachment to who you used to be, right? Would you stop indulging in what people think of you and say about you and instead work on what you think of you and think of you and think about you, right? It's so much more freeing on the other side of self-compassion and self-kindness when you can just be kind to yourself, right? Extend grace to yourself. So I hope this episode was helpful in helping you learn the basics of self-kindness and what flooding is. And I just want you to practice when you notice yourself again, having a reaction in the present moment that is too big for what is happening, to remind yourself the five key statements. The danger is not happening now. Something old is being triggered. This is about the past. If it's this bad now, it gives me a sense of how hard it was then. And I will not allow my history to keep me from living the life I want now. This sentence for me is so powerful and not just in this context, but like you just get to decide to reinvent yourself every day and your history is not going to keep you from living the life you want now. It's okay to reinvent yourself. It's okay to change. It's okay to show up differently. It's okay if like people are like, oh, are you reading self-help books now? Oh, are you changing? It's okay to be that way. Because we have this one life and we have to live it well, right? The reason I say this is when somebody shared with me that they're trying to change and they're trying to self-improve and the people, and it feels fake. Of course it feels fake because it's not what you're used to, right? Of course it feels fake in the beginning when you have to thank your spouse and appreciate them and give them hugs and love on them. Of course, if they're not used to it, they're like, whoa, what do you want? Of course, it feels weird. It's like the first time you wear a new pair of Spanx, right? Of course, it feels weird because you've never done it before. But over time, you get used to it, right? So give yourself permission to evolve. It is okay to change. It is okay that the people in your life are like, what is even happening? I don't like this change. If you like your change, Do you, boo? Do you? Because at the end of the day, you only have one person to be answerable to, and that is you. And if you like the person you're becoming, they better get on board or move over and create space for the amazing people that are coming into your life. And that's okay. You don't have to appease everybody. You don't have to be everything to everyone, but you 100% have to be kind compassionate and graceful towards yourself. So have an amazing week and I'll talk to you next week. Bye now. I'm Shira Bergbauer and you've been listening to the Stethoscopes to Swaddles podcast. New episodes are out every Monday. These episodes are created by me, Shira Bergbauer, and produced by Cassidy Mitchell. If you enjoyed this show or found it helpful, please rate it and review us on Apple Podcasts. If the concepts I share on this podcast resonate with you or you're ready to change your relationships and mindset, I can help you. If you'd like in-depth, personalized support, I'd love to invite you to apply for my Life and Mindset coaching program. Just imagine you and I every week working together as I teach you the tools to up-level your life. To book your free one-hour consultation call, go to www.stethoscopestoswaddles.com forward slash consultation. You're doing a great job, Mama. Have a great week. Bye now.